welcome friends to this second half of the first day of our celebration, three day celebration for Gandhara of Great Master. I'm very happy to see you again. Always happy to see you. It's such a good feeling to meet friends at spiritual level. We meet people at physical level. We meet people at mental level. We meet people at spiritual level. We meet people at sensory levels also. These are different relationships we have. And when I meet somebody whose spirit is seeking, I feel very happy. I feel very happy. Because the spiritual seeking is coming from right inside. People say, after initiation, how do we know the Master is always with us? How do we know the radiant form of the Master is within? We've tried very hard and we don't see it. I received lots of emails. The average number of emails seems 700 a day, but not all asking the same question. Many of them saying, how can we cure our diabetes? Some saying, how can we win the next lottery? Once a person asked me, can we see the lottery number that's come to, coming tomorrow by going to tomorrow at the astral plane? I said, yes. He said, I am going to try very hard. <laughs> and he tried. And whether it was a dream state or astral state, he saw some lottery numbers. And he was very happy that I am going to win $5 million tomorrow. So when he woke up, he forgot the numbers. <laughs> he tried very hard. What happened? He said, I remember. There was a 2 in it and there was an 8 in it. But that was all. The number next day came out, 2 and 8 were there. No other number were known to him. He never got the 5 million. I once had a dream that I won a lottery. $5 million. And I was very happy. So as I was going to collect the money, they said cash or check. I said cash. <laughs> cash is king. I was told. <laughs> when they brought the money, just when they were going to give me, I woke up. <laughs> I tried very hard to go to sleep again. <laughs> I said, let me at least collect my money, then I can wake up. <laughs> It's so interesting how we get desires and attachments to this world. And they look so real, the only reality, our only life here. And that is why it's very difficult to leave this place. When a perfect living master initiates us, he has placed his radiant form in us at that very moment. It's not that you have to get it at some point. It's already there. How do you find out? Very simple. I am trying to solve the problem of many people who write to me. I'm telling you today that the astral self is the one that sees the astral radiant form. These eyes don't see it. But the imaginative eyes, which we are talking of earlier in the morning, they see it. Therefore, how do we get to it? First, imagine it. Now, imagination is of two kinds. One is a pure imagination, you are building up an image yourself. Or you are building it from a photograph. The second is to remember the master. That's not the same thing. Supposing you have had a meeting with the master, and you remember how he walked, how he talked, what he said, and you remember that incident, and then you close your eyes and remember that incident, and the Master's picture comes up as you had seen earlier. If you can concentrate on that picture, that picture becomes alive and goes on to go do things and say things further than what said earlier. That's the first step. The same thing becomes the radiant form of the master. So you have access all the time. Also, the picture can be made up by the mind also. The mind is a negative force in these things. And many of you have known that the mind has come in the big way when you try to go on the spiritual path. Sometimes the mind becomes more active when you try to get away from it. 
because it, it looks like the mind is trying to have its own survival. So it fights for its survival. So the mind can also make up pictures. So that is why when a great, when a master, perfect living master, initiates us, he gives us words to repeat, which we call Simran or Mantra, uh, whatever word you want to give it, it says words for repeating. Those are words normally given, which are not normally used by us in our day-to-day -day language. There is a reason for that. If they give the word, if a master gives you words to repeat, like, uh, like, take a slice of pizza <laughs> as a mantra. <laughs> I have tried that mantra once, by the way. <laughs> you can think of nothing but pizza. Therefore, supposing you have a mantra that is using words which don't make sense to you at the time when they are given to you. But as you proceed to have inner experiences, they begin to make sense. Those will be good mantra. The reason is that the mantra is supposed to perform several functions. It's not merely for repetition. There's a good mantra, there's a good powerful words, therefore we are repeating them. First of all, the repetition of words is to prevent your mind of thinking of something else. Since your mind is always thinking in words, in your language, to put new words and repeat them with the mind, not with the tongue. If then you repeat them with the mind, you are not letting the mind think as much as it would otherwise. It's a, it's a big help. People make one mistake, and I'm trying to point out that today because many people make that mistake. They repeat the words and keep on thinking about other things at the same time. And they think they are doing their Simran or Mantra repetition. It's not true. Because the Mantra should be repeated with the mind. And the whole of the mind should be occupied in it. Now the mind has many levels of thinking. It's not one level. Supposing you are repeating some words for the sake of repetition. The mind can comment upon it, you are, you are repeating too fast, you are too slow. That's also a thought. A thought over your repetition. Now that thought can also take you away. That thought can take you to various places outside which it does normally. Therefore, the correct repetition of mantra is that if any other commentating thoughts come on it, that should also repeat the words. There can be several levels. His Holiness Dalai Lama, when he left Tibet in exile, I happened to be in a job where it was my duty to receive him and to house him in Dharamsala. I was the deputy commissioner of that district. It just came to my an opportunity to see him. He was a great meditator. He used to meditate with the assistance of his two tutors for eight hours a day. We used to go. He had just learned a little bit of our language and English language. So I had a Land Rover given to me by the government and it was normally driven by a chauffeur, but the Lai Lama wanted the night drove it myself. So we could just drive away and talk about meditation. And he said he has been able to find levels, up to eight levels of the mind thinking. I have normally seen people who can identify that the mind is thinking and on top of it another thought is coming, on top of it another thought is coming up to five levels. Two, three is very common. Now, the good repetition of the mantra would be if you repeat at all levels. That means you hear more than one voice repeating it. Your thoughts can create more than one voice. One voice you are inducing in the beginning to repeat, another voice that was commenting and then you join in the repetition. Third commentator comes, also join. Then the mind plays another trick. It brings somebody's picture in front of you, a person. A person comes and you are looking at that person and repeating at the same time, your mind is on the person, not on the repetition. To fight that, to get the person out is not a good solution. Solution is let that person also join in the repetition. Good repetition, effective meditation by repetition, effective withdrawal of attention to the third eye center takes place when every image you see, every thought that comes is involved in the repetition of those words. That's how it should be done.
Otherwise, it's like a carrot repeating and thinking of everything else. Uh, Kabir, Kabir explains that. Kabir, the great Indian saint, I'll tell you his quotation, then translate it for you. Kabir says, Mala to karme phire, jeeb phire mukh mahi, manua to chaho desh phire, ye to sumaran nahi. He says, the beads are in your hand, you're moving the beads in your hand, and the tongue is repeating the words, and the mind is roaming all around the world, do not call it a simran. This is not the repetition. And then he adds on that you only get simran when the mind is fully involved in the repetition. It's very important that we should have use of these words. This is one use, a mechanical use of the words to prevent other words of thought from coming in. It's only a mechanical use. It's not a spiritual use. It's just to control the thoughts that are going in. But then the second use of these words also. And that use is that when a perfect living master gives you any words to repeat, any words in any language, when he gives them at the time of initiation, he empowers them with his own positive power. So they become positive words. Positive in the sense that if you are repeating them, negativity runs away from you. That's a great thing. And this is useful, this particular part of the Simran that a perfect living master gives is useful both in this physical world and internally in meditation. I said in the morning and in the astral plane, there are some good places, there are some not so good places. And these, these and taking a trip just into the astral plane, just for curiosity, can take you to negative territories also. I told you the story of a baby in the morning. Okay, Dr. Shikuntala got convinced about the path because of that baby's uh, deep coma from which she woke up and talked. Another incident about the baby is that once she was in a room and early morning we heard her screaming. And since the uh, her small, uh, small cubical type of house, was very close to ours. We heard and we tried to open the door. We couldn't. We called the great master whose house was next door. And the great master came. We broke the door. The baby was in a strange state, howling, crying, and wouldn't say anything to us. We said something, some hysterical situation has arisen. She's in some deep hysteria of some kind. We don't know what is happening. So great master came and said, and I said, she is not listening, I and other people. We said, she is not listening to anybody. Great Master said, I will speak to her. And he said, where are you? She said, I am in hell. What kind of hell? And she described the torture being given to astral disembodied souls uh, in a hell, which is horrible, almost worse than the description they give in our scriptures about hell. And she, she said, I can't stand, I'm screaming, screaming to see it. Great Master said, are they hurting you? She said, no. Then why are you screaming? She said, I can't even stand what they are doing to the souls here, what they are doing to the people here. He said, repeat your mantra and come out. She said, it's so terrible, I've forgotten the mantra. He said, can you hear my voice? She said, yes. Now follow my voice. And then she opened her eyes, she put her head on his feet, and then Great Master talked to all of us who were around. He said, unguided trips in meditation to these territories in the astral plane is not advisable. Because you can go to negative territory and have bad experiences. People have had bad experiences. So it's better to be either accompanied by a guide or use the meditational techniques a perfect living master has given you, which includes the use of those words, which have been empowered to prevent you from having that experience. So this is another very useful thing with those words that we get. The outside use of that is that you can meet people, you feel they are very negative. Sometimes we come across people for no reason. We say we don't like them. We have no idea why we are meeting a person for the first time and we don't like them. These likes and dislikes 
are all coming from past lives. Nobody comes into our life just out of nothing. They all come out of what is a past life experience. That's the nature of the creation of this, of this destiny here. Karma, destiny is created by the principle. It's a past life and everybody comes back on that basis. Does not mean that everybody who has come into this life has come from the immediate past life. It could have come from a tenth past life. Or maybe even earlier. In the story about Lord Krishna and in the Mahabharata, it says that one blind king, he says, I have looked into my past lives with your help. I have seen 100 of my past lives. I did do nothing to become blind. Why am I blind? And Krishna says to him, look further back, the 104th life, you took out the eyes of a person. And he said, that can that karma can stay so long? Yes, because the dangerous karma is not the last life. Dangerous karma is the accumulated lot of karma which we put into reserve. As you know, there are three types of karma. One, which we are coming with, which creates our destiny. We call it pralambha karma, pralambha or coming from past life and that creates events like birth, death, illness, accidents, probably marriages, <laughs> probably have a little problem hurting the word marriage. But all these events that happen in life are from past life and that's what is our destiny here. We meet people and we are destined to meet them. Then, lot of time, 70 to 80 percent of our life is made up of these things over which we have no control. They all come and we have no control where we'll be born, who we'll meet, where we'll be stationed, what will happen. All that goes on one by one. Each event of this life becomes the cause of the next event and we just move through life. About 70, 80 percent of life is made up of problem of destiny. In between these events, we get a time when we have to make choices. It looks like options come up, alternatives come up. Shall we choose this or that? Two jobs are offered. Shall I take this job or the second job? I fall in love with two women. Which one should I marry? <laughs> and all, all kinds of options come in life. And then we make a choice. When we make a choice, a process takes place in our head called deliberation. That means the mind says, should I or should I not? Should I do this or should I do that? Only when deliberation comes in the mind and you make a choice, you create a new karma. Otherwise, all old destiny. Everything else is accidental and old destiny, except when you are making a choice with sufficient deliberation in your mind. Should I do it or not do it? Should I go this way or that way? When that deliberation takes place, you're creating a new karma. So, karma is not created by action. Karma is created by intention to act. So supposing you have an intention to act, you create a karma. So since we have so many, so many intentions, so we create a lot of karma. Some of them we carry into actual action and that becomes a double whammy and then you, it becomes a bigger karma. The results of these karma, you do good things, you are rewarded. You do bad things, you are punished. Sometimes in the same life, very often the next life, sometimes in a life, hundred lives away. Where does the karma stay? It reserves, it, this, this uh, new karma we create, we call karivan karma. And what cannot be filled up in the next life goes into a reserve called sinchit karma. That is a reserve held in the mind. The mind holds all this. When we are reborn, the mind is still the same. They are not reborn with new minds, they are reborn with new bodies. Very often with the same astral self, same sensory systems, same mind. The mind's life is very long. It's also born and dies, but the life is in terms of millions of years, three to four million, five million years of physical time. And so we are born with the same mind again and again. It carries all this heavy burden of Sinjit Karma with it. And when the system that creates a future life based upon the previous life, that works. Some people say there is a guy sitting up there who decides. 
I used to wonder how his job, he, how he does his job. They sometimes call it Dhar, in India, Dharam Raj, Angel of Death, the Archangel of Death, somebody who's determining. And when you are dying, you see your whole life. In a, in a flash, the whole life comes up. This is what you did. This, this is good, this is bad. And as you are seeing it while dying, that's what's creating the next life for you. And that guy is wondering and saying, he must have a nice computer with him. I used to wonder, if a person has met 1,000 people in a life, and the next life has to be settled with the accounts with those 1,000 people, it must be a very big problem for computers to solve, how to arrange them to meet in different events. And if thousands of people have to be put together in future lives, it's a very difficult thing. So I was very surprised when I found that the answer to my question was totally different. The answer was, we do not meet the same people. We meet the images of those people which we create. That means if we have karma of a person, he appears as a person in the same next life, but he is an extension of our own experience. So the whole life is being created from inside. And therefore, there is no problem for that guy to create all the people that are needed for the karma. It's a very different answer than I was expecting. So anyway, this is another thing that when you have this uh, similar menu, if you are using that, some of the negative entities that are supposed to come, they kept away because they are empowered words. That's a very big use, external use and internal use. So these are very useful means that are given to us. So when the mind pretends that it is seeing the man, picture of the master. It's imagining. I am seeing the master. It's only mind making up a trick. Repeat the words. Image disappears. There's a certain part of the face of a human being, of a perfect living master, that the mind can never replicate if the words are being repeated. Those are the eyes and the forehead of the master. You can remember that, that the the moment you see a picture made up by the mind, repeat the symbol, eyes and forehead will disappear instantly. Because the mind cannot make it up. If it still stays, it is the master. That is the radiant form of the master. Now some people say, since we call it the radiant form, there must be a lot of sparks flying out of it. How do we, how do we make him radiant? And this is, doesn't look like what I am saying, doesn't make him look like that radiant. Why are we saying radiant? The reason why we say radiant form of the master is because in the astral world, everything is radiant, including yourself. You are equally radiant as the master is. Now, I'll give you an example. You close your eyes completely, cover them up with black, sure, black mask. I hope I'm still being, I hope it still works. Doesn't matter. Can you still hear me? I didn't know the little thing is doing all this. <laughs> this does nothing, this is a microphone. <laughs> this was show only, I think. <laughs> this two should think I'm speaking with the microphone. <laughs> okay, I was I was telling you the radiant form of the master is because you can see him in total darkness. That's why we call that the radiant form. If you close your eyes completely and cover them up, I won't demonstrate now, <laughs> with a black cloth. So it's totally dark. And you want to imagine somebody's figure, you can see it. Right now you can see it. Where, where, where are you seeing in total? Even when the total darkness is inside, you want to imagine some num uh, figure, you can imagine it. You want to imagine an object, you can imagine it. The fact that something can be seen in total darkness, that's what makes it radiant. But of course, at some point, when the light starts coming in, and I'll talk to you later about the, the what is light? I'll talk to you later about light and sound, the very important features in our meditation. Light and sound are very important. When the light comes, then, the light radiance of the master is really very strong. 
at different levels of awareness, the master's radiance and light increases. So you can say that he can be so bright, but then you are also bright. When you first time find yourself as a soul, there is no space-time like we know here, but there is something in which you can experience. If you want to use a physical example, physical comparison, it will be like your own soul is lighted up like 16 of the physical solar sun, soul, which you can't even look at. Yeah. That's your own light. So, light is a big factor. So, at some point, it becomes very radiant and lighted, but it can start with just something that can be seen in the darkness and it shines. So, but do not expect there is a spark flowing and there is light flowing. Sometimes I see pictures drawn. I say, whose picture is the radiant form? The master. A lot of light is going. I say, it looks like the sun's picture, not the master. It looks like a big bulb. Uh, light is inside. In a last meditation workshop I held, I told people with their eyes closed in a dark, darkened room. I said, can you see a light bulb? Yeah, we can imagine a light bulb. See, can you see a switch, one of those which, which you make it dim or you can make it light by pulling it up and down? Yeah, we have the switch. You can make it up, more up. Light brightened. The, the bulb was so lighted they never seen outside. Just during meditation. So, there is so much light inside. It's unimaginable. These eyes, physical eyes can never see it. But these inner eyes can see. The very inner eyes that I say can be, can be awakened. They are already awake, but they can be awakened to the extent they become independent from the physical eyes by withdrawing attention from the physical body. So the radiant form of the master is always there. And you can talk to the master, repeat the words. If you are initiated by a perfect living master, repeat the words. The face of the master stays, master is there. You can talk. Sometimes it looks like the master is moving away and not staying. Master does not move. Our attention moves. We can't concentrate our attention there. If you practice with the whole game of attention, it's whole game of moving your attention, using your attention. Attention is the most valuable thing. As I said in the morning, consciousness is the ability to be aware. Awareness is what you are actually aware of at that time. And out of awareness, where you want to put your attention becomes the highlight of that awareness. People give an example that if you go to an orchestra and there are a lot of musical instruments playing and you say, I like the drums and I want to do, listen to the drums more carefully, the drums become louder, the other instruments become less. Nothing is happening on the stage, it's happening into, into us. Our attention can concentrate on something and make that more aware and the less around it, less aware. That's exactly the principle that we use. By using our attention, we are able to withdraw our whole awareness of the body. We can use the attention where we like, and we can concentrate attention. These are two big factors, big gifts to us. The gift of using our attention, with which we do normal work in the world. In worldly work, we are using our attention all the time. And when we concentrate our attention, then we get more benefit out of it. It's just the ability to concentrate our attention that keeps us there. When the attention is less concentrated, the radiant form of the master appears to go away. When you concentrate it more, it comes back. So these are all practical things. And I really want to share with seekers, especially those who are already on the spiritual path, I want to share that you may be stuck somewhere just for this one reason, that you are not using these talents which have been naturally gifted to us. So that is why it's really important that we should know first of all clearly what we are doing is not such a mysterious thing as we have made out. We made the whole thing so mysterious that we can't have a handle on it. No, it's merely that we are sitting here in a physical body it's not the body, it's the soul, it's the creator of the soul, it's God himself with a, 
experience of individuation of souls with the souls attached to minds minds creating space and time and creating an area where cause and effect can operate the mind assisted by sense perceptions to make it a bigger experience vaster experience and sense perception placed into a physical body so we think just it was very fry in a large dramatic in place we like to have that experience that's why we are here but it does not mean that we should be trapped in the experience if we know have a knowledge of this thing if we have not only knowledge but awareness that this is how it is operating we will still operate here but we will know we just come to see a show when we go to see a movie we see the movie we sit in the audience the movie is taking place on the screen the shadows there is only a flat screen whether you are seeing a flat screen movie two dimensional or you are wearing glasses or using other techniques which have now come up which makes it three dimensional it's just a flat screen you are seeing a movie on flat screen characters are appearing you don't know their shadows the characters something is going to happen people sit on their edge people cry i cry in movies i don't cry anywhere else and i don't realize why that is so my children if they come and take me to a movie they carry extra handkerchief with them so i can use them for wiping my tears movies look more real to me than this physical life movie when we look at it nobody sees nobody wants to know how the movie is being created they don't want to know that the shadow which is being created characters are being created are being created from a projector behind behind you you are not looking at the projector you are looking at the movie you are looking at the screen the projector behind you the movie has been predetermined it's in the film in the projector the light in the projector is throwing the shadow on the screen and no matter how many times you see the movie it will be the same film of course we say now what's going to happen next we are watching a movie and wondering what will happen next we we even forget that what will happen next is going to happen we never say it's predetermined watching a simple movie we don't think it's predetermined of course if we knew it's a film loaded behind and it's already been shot long ago it's just the memory of that in captured in a film that's being shot this is a identical situation with us the light of the soul inside is projecting a movie created by in the mind filmed already chosen by us loaded into the mind projected through sense perceptions and the body with sensory perceptions outside it's a movie now supposing you know it's a movie what will happen same thing that will happen in the movie murder is taking place and you don't don't leave your seats horrible things are happening on the screen nobody runs to say i'll intervene in that you will know it's just a movie you pay the price to come and see the movie this is the same movie and awareness can make so much difference is this watching this life so when you have this awareness does not mean you want to run away from it and go somewhere else they know somewhere else it's all here there is no other place some people start thinking this is physical plane above that is astral plane then there is causal plane then the true home must be somewhere up there and i see some people praying up to god they must be some somewhere up in the sky external sky has nothing to do with god external world has nothing to do with god god is inside god is making you have the ability to see god is making you have the ability to have life therefore when you have awareness of that kind your whole experience of this world changes because you are seeing it in a very different way you know why you are seeing it why it was created what the you still enjoy it like you enjoy a movie it doesn't mean that just by having a awareness of how a reality is created you will not enjoy reality you will enjoy more because then you will know that the ups and downs that are coming are part of the movie the other thing is one big difference when you see a movie on a screen you are not in the movie the characters are on the movie you are watching from a distance in the audience this movie 
you have chosen to be so close to the screen you have placed yourself in one of the characters you have placed yourself as a witness as a spectator of the movie in the head of one of the characters and just seeing the movie through the eyes of that character and you think the character is seeing it you become that character you forget that you are watching this movie now supposing you have the awareness that you can get through meditational experiences you will see this world by not feeling that this body is seeing it you will feel you are seeing it from behind the eyes and this is one character which you are wearing as a body the other characters a beautiful movie is wonderful the whole attitude can change this spiritual path is not merely to get some isolated experiences it is to change your life right here it changes your life right here it makes your life totally different it makes you so blissful because you are not part of the movie that we created you are separated but you are only enjoying it by identifying with the characters for a short time which is very different from just being the characters you are not the characters you are just enjoying it from being inside a character so that's why you will find that when you have a good look at the world from inside your approach to the world is totally different do you can you hate people characters can hate each other will you hate how will you hate your own creation how can you hate creation when you know the whole thing has come up from the single source the single source of consciousness which we call god creator whatever like word you like to give it the totality of consciousness is one everything has come out of that and once you realize that part which is totally total enlightenment of your own totality of your own self from that point of view everything is part of you every event is part of you you created it you created it for an experience wonderful experience how far creation can go you did it from there how can you then from that point of view hate anybody you will love everything that exists there because you created it and that love which is in your awareness from that point of view you are in a human body the human being will be expressing the same love to everybody around the people wonder how can we looked at great master how can great master just by being with people make them feel so much loved because love flowed from him love flowed from him because he was looking at the people from a different position in his head from the totality which is within oneself let me explain that nothing is outside if you want to find the truth go within more within more within more within further within you go you find more and more not outside not higher this concept of higher and lower is mental concept mind loves it mind loves to put things in a classification this is high this is low mind loves five levels eight levels i can make it 10 also so somebody says 11 i'll say 12 and i'll describe the 12 i can divide up all the experiences that you have into 1000 parts if necessary depending on who i'm debating with if i want to win the argument <laughs> the, the point is mind loves classification and we say the physical plane and you have seen charts charts being drawn physical on top of it is astral causal this and many masters explained that there is a physical form which is a physical body a physical body creates physical experience if you don't have physical body you don't have physical experience if you have physical body you have physical world physical experience you go to the astral level become astral world astral experience part of the astral experience is overlapping with the physical so you see physical things physical people but you are not physical so that's called the overlap so there is an overlap between the physical and the astral a similar overlap between the astral and the causal and the and these overlaps the second overlap is sometimes called a crooked tunnel because you can sit in the middle of the overlap and and see both you can see the astral and the causal when you see that then you can say oh i can know both 
But since you have to be in the middle to see that, if you are a little lower than that, you only have the astral. Little above that, you will only see causal. So when you are in the middle, there is a crooked way, so you can see both. That point has been specially described as the bunk canal or the crooked tunnel. And they say that some souls are even sitting there and having that kind of experience. If you want to understand that these levels are not placed one above the other, they are placed within one of each other. Within. The further within you go, the further you can go to these different states that are described as higher and higher and above. There is nothing above or below. It's all within. And you have to go within to have this experience. This is so vital to know because people want to think that this is a separate state. The astral is a separate state. Here we are sitting in a body. If we had, did not have an awakened astral self in us, our eyes and ears and hands will not work. Our sense perceptions that are working in the body, we say we are alive, therefore they are working. Okay, we are alive, but they are working because they can work even independently. And I told you how you can imagine and they still work. I, in my meditational experiences, sometimes I teach people that uh, enjoy a little experience, close your eyes, imagine there are flowers next to you, there is a drink next to you, there is a, a snack next to you, and then now one by one, smell the flowers, look at the color of the flowers, then take a drink, your favorite beverage, and, and enjoy your snack. And they are able to do it with their eyes closed. When their eyes are opened, they can still remember the color of the flower because the color of the flower was not the same that they imagined. They changed. Most people see the flower that they saw which they wanted to imagine were different from what they saw there. The other things also changed. They did not, and most people say, we didn't imagine that we could have seen those things. Where did they come from? It's all an astral experience. Sensory experience of the astral plane. It's very simple to get it. Let's demystify this whole thing that somewhere else, some astral plane, we have to go there. Don't have to go anywhere. It's right here. So that is why we withdraw our attention and go there. We draw further attention. And that people say is very difficult because they've never done it. We can, they say we can meditate with this body, but we can't meditate with the inner body. Why not? It's equally easy or equally difficult, I suppose. But it is only the inner self that, when it meditates, goes to the causal plane, not otherwise. Some people have glimpses. Because everything is inside, you can have a glimpse of the inner sky. You can have a glimpse of even totality. You can have a glimpse sometimes, it's all one, there's nothing else. Those glimpses can come anytime because they're all inside. But to have a sustained experience at will in a human body, you need to have a certain amount of practice under guidance of a perfect living master. This whole business of karma is only of the mind. Soul has no karma. Never had, never will. Why are, why are we crying? We are the soul. Why should we cry over karma when it is not our karma? It's an attachment to us to have an experience. We take it off, it will end. You just have to take the mind off, there is no karma. You put it on, you are back in karma. It's like a, like, a, like a piece of costume or something we are wearing. These are all costumes. So when we are able to take the costumes off, we have new experiences. And the ultimate experience of the reality, which is amazing that we should have this knowledge and not experience it. And that is where great master used to speak with great authority. That we talk so much, we talk about reality, we talk about the path, we don't practice it. We have just become outside, outsiders on the path. That we, having knowledge, we don't practice it. He used to speak very forcefully on that. I have not seen many, many teachers, many masters talking that forcefully like great master would talk. He talked with authority. I remember reading the Bible and reading about Jesus Christ's Sermon on the Mount. And when he had finished talking, the Bible says, 
after he spake there was hush upon the multitude for he spake like one with authority and not like the scribes he spoke because he was speaking from experience and not from studies or books like the scribes that's the nature of a perfect living master they speak with authority because they're speaking what they're experiencing right when they're speaking not that they've learned something from books or from other people and then they're explaining to us big difference and i remember that great power the great master he spoke with authority because he spoke from what he was experiencing as a human being at the time that he was explaining to us so that's a very big difference so these things affect our soul the masters do not come to look at our bodies the masters come for our soul when our seeking of the soul says i am ready master will appear and all right it's as simple as that in india we say when a chela is ready a guru appears when a disciple is ready the master appears they never say when a disciple is ready he can find a master I don't believe we can ever find a master, perfect living master. Perfect living masters are so ordinary people, so ordinary, more ordinary than ordinary people. How can we say they are masters? How can we find them? There's no way that we can find them, but they can find us, and that's what happens when we are ready for something beyond our mind. When we are ready for our true home, a perfect living master appears. now theoretically i can tell you good model how they do it they have marked souls now i want to explain this some people have asked me about this question we say there are marked souls these perfect living masters come for picking up their marked souls since they come as human beings living in a human society with a human life with a human term of life for them they can't be picking up all the marked souls so they pick up some marked souls for which they have come as a human being others other masters will come and they will pick up the other marked souls so to make it easy to understand we say there's a list a and list b that when a master appears in this world he picks up his marked souls and takes them back to their true home in that very lifetime this day master comes and he and by by his look at the people who we looks at from that point of view he marks them at that time and future masters come in future lives and take them back home list 2 list b so this is a good concept but now think of it another way master is operating from a point where there is no time and therefore he cannot say there are marked souls he is operating from a time which is which is just one time therefore one can also say from an enlightened point of view when a perfect living master marks you then you are a marked soul it does not mean that you are marked and therefore he comes to you he comes to you because he marks you so it's very difficult to explain this because we are talking of a non space time event taking place that is where the marking takes place so it's worthwhile knowing that being in the presence of such a person means something has happened just being in the presence of a perfect living master means something has happened and it's very good thing has happened i can tell you that if that is why we call it darshan what is the meaning of the word darshan we go to have a look at the face of a master and that's supposed to be a great thing there's an old story about narad muni narad was one of the munis in india one of the holy man who went around from place to place house to house and he had some spiritual enlightenment and he said that he could invoke the blessings of brahma the creator of the universe and he could talk to brahma also so one day narad was walking around and he saw a lot of people running to see a master perfectly living master and he stopped and said why are you running so fast to see somebody yes perfectly living masters here we are going for his darshan he said what is darshan the darshan need to look at him he said what do you get by looking at a man does he say anything does he teach you anything does he give you anything 
No, 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 we only have darshan. We just look at him and we are very happy. Puzzled by this, Narad Muni went into his own meditation and he manifested Brahma, his, his idol. And he said, Brahmaji, I want to know these people run around to have the, just look at a master and have what they call darshan. What is the value of darshan? Brahmaji said, Oh Narad Muni, for this question, you have to go to a certain village and go to a pond in that village and there's a snake in that water. You go and ask the snake, he'll give you the answer. So since Brahmaji gave that order, he, Narad Muni went to that village and found there was a pond and he went there in the water, there was a snake with his head up. He said, now the translation uh, is in English, but in Punjabi sounds a little better. I tell you in English. He said, Mr. Snake, <laughs> what is the benefit of having darshan of a perfect living master? The snake looked at him, dropped his head and died. He said, this is no answer. So he went back into meditation and he's manifested the image of Brahmaji again. And he said, Brahmaji, you told me to go and ask this question, what is the benefit of a darshan of a master? And the snake died. He said, oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. <laughs> Brahmaji said, now you go to a little distant village. There, there is a man who just bought a new parrot. It's in a cage. You go and ask this question from the parrot. He'll give you an answer. So Narad Muni now set up for the parrot's house. And he found the jeweler who had a parrot. He said, I just bought a parrot. He said, can I have a little talk with your parrot? Sure, a parrot is very lucky. Narad Muni, you came to talk to a parrot. Very lucky parrot. So he asked the parrot, Mr. Parrot, what is the benefit of having darshan of a perfect living master? The parrot looked at him, dropped his head and died. He said, this is a strange way. I am getting no answer. So he again went into meditation. I didn't think I will tell you these stories, but anyway. <laughs> Maybe the whole thing is a story. <laughs> he asked, he went back to Brahmaji and he says, Brahmaji, I asked the parrot the same question and the parrot died. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. I'll tell you now, Brahmaji said, finally, you will get the answer. You have to travel to another kingdom. In that kingdom, the queen has just given birth to a baby boy. Go and ask that baby boy this question. You'll get the answer. Oh, Narad Muni says, this snake and parrot is all right, but now the human baby boy is asking me to go there. I hope that experience will not be repeated. Anyway, after long travel, he reached that kingdom and the king was very happy to receive him. He said, after a long time, Narad Muni, you come to our kingdom, very happy, welcome. He says, has your queen given birth to a baby boy? Yes, recently she gave birth to a baby boy. Can I see that infant? Sure, the infant is so lucky to have your blessings. Come in. So Narad Muni says, I like to have, see the infant in private. He said, all right. So goes and see the little infant in private and says, Mr. Infant, I have been asking this question. What is the benefit of seeing these masters and having their darshan and the infant spoke up and he said Narad Muni I am the same snake you saw in the pond Narad Muni I am the same parrot you saw in the cage Narad Muni you are not a saint you are just a Muni but just by seeing you I was able to have a human birth the benefit of seeing perfectly masters a thousand times more so that is how we got the answer about darshan but they say that beside darshan there is something even more valuable and that is called drishti. What the difference between the two? In darshan we look at the master. In drishti the master looks at us. When the master with his eyes looks at us into our eyes, that has a benefit far more. A benefit is coming from the eyes of a man with that awareness, a live awareness when he looks into our eyes it burns even the karma that we are going through. It even alters 
the destiny that we are carrying with us. It's a very big thing. So drishti is even higher than the darshan that we get. If you get a darshan, the holy Sikh scripture, Guru Granth Sahib says that if you have seen the darshan of a Satguru, your account is finished. Lekha Nibriya. Your account is finished just by having a darshan. So darshan itself guarantees that your time has come to go back and you are marked so. And drishti is even more valuable. So these are things that are taught to us. We, but these can be questioned. I particularly was a great questioner of these things. Where is the proof? I was very fond of saying, where is the proof? The proof of the pudding lies in the eating. And I said, I'll only get proof if I eat something. Great master gave me something to eat. They found the proof. There's no other proof except to experience it. You can experience it, but to experience, you have to have the basic faith to take one step and convince yourself with as many questions as you like. Are you ready to take the first step? Take it. If it works, take the second. Otherwise, walk back and do anything else you like. So, there are some things. Can, can I say I have proof? Of these things. I was at Harvard University studying there. I, I had arguments with, and I, know, I can't call arguments, discussions with the professors, particularly <coughs> of philosophy and psychology. They would come and talk to me. As you might remember, two of them were expelled from the university <coughs> at the same time, but I was not responsible for that. <laughs> Richard Alpert, Timothy Leary, both were there. And they were both expelled for experimenting with mushrooms and drugs and things, LSD, DMT, those things came up at that time. What they were telling me was, whatever you are talking about, these higher levels of consciousness and these experiences can all be generated by suggestion. Hypnosis can do that. Hypnotic, hypnotic suggestion can do these things. You may be undergoing an auto-suggestion. They are automatically suggesting to yourself that these things are actually happening. You are creating it in your mind. Good argument they gave me. I said, that's a very good argument you're giving. I accept it. I am using a very strange method of auto-suggestion by which I get 24-7 happiness. You people are taking Prozac, I know. <laughs> you people are all in great despondency. They were. They were trying to take care of their, of their depressions. I said, what a good method to learn some kind of auto-suggestion by which you can get these experiences even if they're not real. So from even that point of view, I said it's a good thing to start, but that's not true. The fact is, there are some things which prove themselves beyond a doubt. And I'll tell you two items of those, which all of you have had. One, that you exist. Do you need proof for that? It's an experience you are having right now that you actually exist. In what form? body or real or whatever, is a secondary question. You don't need a proof. Somebody says you don't exist. You would say, no, I know it, I exist. This is self-evident proof. There's a second proof. When you wake up in the morning, you know you are awake. Nobody's ever questioned this. Supposing when you get up in the morning, you don't move. You don't pinch yourself to see if I'm awake or not. You don't even open your eyes. Eyes are closed, you are lying in bed, same position that you went to sleep, you know you are awake. Now, if 10 people came and say, you are not awake, say, I know I am awake, how can you tell me? How does this experience of waking up in the morning, which all of us have had, carry its own proof? The reason is, if you carefully examine the reason, that when we wake up, we remember we went to sleep. That's the key. The key is, immediately the memory comes, this is where we slept, the rest was a dream or a sleep state, and we are sure we are awake. The experience of going to the astral plane, causal plane, is awakening, is a higher awakefulness, and carries the same experience that you were already there before you ever came here. Your coming here was not sudden. It came through stages, same stages that you trace back when you find your own truth and your own reality. I'm sharing these things with you because these are practical things. 
and they should be practiced and understood by practice, not debated. You can't always debate. If you want to debate, you can, just for the sake of fun, but not for the sake of experience and, and proof. Proof of these wakefulnesses lies in the experience of recall of your being in that state earlier. This is not our home. We belong to our true home. We've always been there. We have created these experiences in our true home, not outside. This is not happening outside somewhere. We did not leave our true home. People say we have to go back in a journey to true home. There is no journey involved. We are in our true home having this experience of different levels. When we wake up, we don't find we have gone somewhere else. We find we have woken to where we originally were. Originally, we were all one consciousness. And these experiences have been generated for more experiences at different levels of consciousness only. And it's all retraceable right from here. The question can be, if this is all a projected experience, and many people believe that, I also believe it, that we, from our consciousness, from our mind, can project a world outside and think it is real. And I believe it is happening like that. If I know it, if I am an experienced person, if I know I am projecting all of you, would I be talking to you? If I know you are just shadows being created from me, would I be talking to you? No, I am not taking it as a projected, I am taking it as reality. Who is taking it as reality? This guy who has a name Ishwar Puri, it's not me. It's the name of the body that is talking to you as part of the role here. That awareness is not being interfered with by this experience at all. And knowledge that we are all the same and one is not interfering with the knowledge that in the play itself, in this movie itself, we have a scope of getting out of the movie and getting out to our truth. And it's the same part of the same self that is generating this experience to come back to its own self. It's remarkable. It is so perfect the way it's operating. Just know, come to know how it is operating and you'll be surprised at how simple it was. There were no building blocks required to build this world. Consciousness could be conscious of anything it became creation. Consciousness was the reality and anything it became conscious of became creation. That's how creation took place. But we are at the talking in the acting the stage in sitting in one of the characters. So we have to learn it from that character. We have identified ourselves with the character in whose body we are sitting. Therefore, to get out, we need another character. Also in the body to talk to, to get out of it. Therefore, that oneness appears in a physical body in the form of perfect living master. It is the creative power, the creator himself, who appears in the form of a perfect living master just to take us back to the same place where we belong. So it's a beautiful setting. I'm very happy that you all came. I could share some of these things with you. And I must tell you, I do not want to share any stories, though I shared one just now. <laughs> I do not want to make stories I can make out of them. I want to tell you what experience you can expect in the company of a perfect living master. You can't find a perfect living master. He's too ordinary. You can be found by seeking. Seek within yourself, in your heart. Don't tell anybody you are seeking. Just seek in your heart. And by coincidence, the perfect living master will come into your life. He may not come straight away. He may send some people to take you a few steps. You may find masters of very various kinds, masters of different levels. And masters do come. They take you up to one stage. Masters take you to heaven. Lots of them. Lots of masters have come. And by the way, in that particular time, that could be considered the perfect living master because nobody was seeking anything more than that. And then, later on, more masters came, taking you beyond. Masters come all the time. But the masters who can take you beyond the mind are very rare, because the seekers of that are very rare. 
The seeker will want their true home beyond the mind. Rare. And they, when they seek for that, they perfectly will master the community life. And the mind says, how can you be sure? How can you be certain? So, masters play games. They are very big game players. I can tell you that. Great master was a game, game player. They play games with us. They lead us to various kind of experiences. And eventually we see, now we can see who you are. Don't play any games. That's what many disciples were heard to say to great master. And now don't play any more games with us. I used to hear that. But it was such a great relationship. True love relationship. If there is true love in this world, I have seen it with the great master and his disciples. I have see, seen with my own eyes what it does. It's very different from attachment. The true love is what the relationship of a disciple with a perfect living master is. And that comes about only by your seeking. I'll be very happy to see you again tomorrow and on Bandara day, day after, which will be a great day of blessings. So I'm very happy that you all came. Blessings to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>